good morning once again, and welcome to Journey Church. God bless you guys. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Uh, also, after second service, if you do what Andrea said and maybe go run a couple errands and come back, we're going to be doing a guest services training. So we want to have an incredibly crazy, over-the-top welcoming environment, especially for Easter. So if you're looking for a place where you could have a big impact and you just want to start getting your feet wet, guest services is a wonderful place to do that. Swing back by here right around 1230 and you won't regret it. It'll be a great time lunch will be served child care is provided and we're going to be doing some new guest services training so i hope you come back and be a part of that team also easter is around the corner as was announced and it truly is our best opportunity to invite people during the course of each and every year and i don't want you to miss this opportunity a thought really came to my mind of how much is a life worth when you start to think about that how much is a life worth you know, we go to great lengths in the natural to attempt to go through medical procedures and other things that we spend all kinds of money to try to save our life in the natural. But what about our eternal life and the eternal opportunity that we have? What if you could change somebody's life for 99 cents? Do you think you would do it? Anybody? Like five of you are shaking your hands like, what is he going to get me into here in just a second? So I understand your reservation. But I wanted to give you maybe a creative way that our team has come up with that maybe you would put into practice just to have a little fun this week. Maybe a 99 cent box of peeps. If you would invite your peeps, come on Jesus, invite your peeps. <laughs> invite your peeps to Easter next week. So what we've done is we've kind of given you some seed that we've already prayed over. As you leave today, you're gonna to find a number of these out there in the lobby. Feel free to grab one. You'll also see whatever invite cards that we have left are going to be out there on that table, and I would encourage you, let's wipe all of them out. If you still have some of those, give out every one that you have with the hopes that something as simple as a box of peeps could get somebody to walk through these doors and then maybe change their eternal life and eternal destination. Would you pray with me over that right now before we invite up our wonderful guest speaker who's going to be here today. You get to see him in a worship context all the time, but Adam's going to be preaching today. In just a moment, I'll ask you to give him a warm welcome. But Lord, we thank you for Easter. We thank you that you would send your one and only begotten son from heaven to earth to show us the way. Lord, may we never take that for granted. May we always remember that such a great price you paid I asked the question earlier, what is a life worth? And you gave your very own life that we might be saved. Lord, would you put it on our heart to evangelize, to tell others about your great love, to go out there into the community and share what you've done in our life and tell people about it. And Father, we just look and pray over these cards that have already been distributed, the mailer that has gone out, these boxes of peeps, and ask you to use these simple pieces of paper with graphics on them to touch and change lives in Jesus' name. And everybody says... Amen. Hey, props out to John Priestmeyer. Um, we, we were getting these ready, and he just couldn't resist. So he went out there and was eating at the country cabin, gave it to every single person inside the country cabin at their table. So get creative. Swing by Publix. Go by the dollar store after service. Maybe buy some chocolates. Do whatever. I, chocolates after my own heart. Come on, Jesus. Go, do whatever you can and get creative and give these out during the course of the week. Would you do me a favor and give Pastor Adam a warm Journey Church welcome? God bless you, brother. Bring it. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Hey, uh, how about the worship team this morning? Wasn't that awesome? Really, really good. I don't know if you knew this, but the, uh, the first song that we played is a song that we wrote. And uh, we've been writing songs and recording them for about a year. And we're probably at the end of the whole process. And we'll be releasing three songs next week. And the song, the first song that we sang is going to be on the next volume. Um, but make sure you pick that up. It's actually available for pre-order right now. If you go to iTunes and search Journey Worship, uh, The Cross, uh, those three songs will come up. We'd love for you to support us, support the music that God is writing through us. And really, honestly, my prayer is that you just experience the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit through these songs that other people would experience the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Because I know that when God moves in somebody's life through music, they're changed forever. I've encountered God in so many different areas, so many different times in life that were 
Uh, I was marked by the presence of God through music and through what God was doing in my life. And uh, we pray that these songs do the same thing for you. Um, and it's just a privilege just to be able to lead a team to where they can run with it and they can go. And um, let's just pray this morning. Let's invite the Holy Spirit here. Let's invite him just to speak to our hearts. So Jesus, Holy Spirit, we welcome you here this morning. We surrender to you this morning, Father. Everything we have and everything we are, we desire you and you alone, Jesus. God, I pray that, that Lord, that, that Father, that you would um, just come in a mighty way this morning and speak to us, Father, as we study Joshua and Caleb, Father God, that you would just move in our hearts and we would receive from you everything that you have for us, God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So as I said, we're studying Joshua and Caleb this morning. Joshua and Caleb were two of the greatest men that have walked the planet. You'll understand this morning why I named my son Caleb. Um, you know, the Bible says about Elijah that he was an ordinary man. And these men we're about to look at are nothing different than you and I. They were ordinary men, but because of their reliance on God, their reliance on the Holy Spirit, they walked and did extraordinary things. These men we are about to look at are heroes, and heroes are people who see good and they realize that good is not good enough. They see ordinary and understand that ordinary is not good enough. They want to be different. They want to be extraordinary. How many of you would like for your life to be defined as extraordinary in here? I know I would. Hero means a person of distinguished courage or ability. It also means someone who is admired for their brave deeds or noble qualities. Caleb and Joshua is a story of faith, of faithfulness, a story of leadership and character, and most of all, a story of obedience and righteousness. Joshua's name means the Lord has delivered, Jehovah is generous, and Yahweh has saved. Caleb means absolute follower of God. That's why I named my son Caleb, that he would be an absolute, unwavering follower of God. That's my prayer for his life. You will see in the coming minutes that the meaning of their names are exactly who these men are. Let me give you some context before we begin this morning going through and reading. Both of these men came out of slavery through the leadership of Moses and the miracle-working power of God. They saw the amazing uh, parting of the Red Sea, which we looked at earlier, about a month ago. They saw manna come from heaven. They saw the pillar of cloud during the day protect them from the sun as they're wandering through the wilderness. They saw the fire at night to warm their camps. And so these men, they saw the extraordinary wonders and miracles of God. So let's read, let's look at Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13, verse 1. It says this, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving. So he's giving it to them, to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers, you will send a man, every one a leader among them. So the nation of Israel is on the verge. They're on the verge. They're right on the border, about to take the promised land. The land God told them that they would have. The land that God told them he was giving them. A land that God said flows with milk and honey. I don't know what that means, but it sounds great, doesn't it? I guess that land was prosperous. It was good. So God has brought them out of bondage. He's brought them out of Egypt, out of slavery. And they were on the border, on the precipice of entering into the land, the promised land for them. So on the, for the sake of time, in the coming verses, you'll see Moses picks out the spies. In verse 6, he picks out Caleb. Verse 8, he picks out Joshua. Let's begin reading again in verse 17. Then Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, Go up this way into the south and go up to the mountains and see what the land is like. Whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many, 
Whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are like camps or strongholds, whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are forests there or not, be of good courage. Now, when reading this, this is a thought that comes to my mind, and it begs the question, did Moses plant the seed of doubt? Did Moses plant the seed of doubt? Did he plant the seed of negativity? You ever thought about that? Because in verse 1 and 2, God didn't tell him to send out the spies in the land and find out what is good and bad. Did he? So why didn't Moses just tell Caleb, just tell the spies, go out, look for the city that we need to attack first. Look for the city that we need to conquer first. Because God, he's with us. He's going to give it to us. Instead, he points out, find out if they're big or they're small. Then he says, be of good courage. Which implies there's stuff out there that you need to be afraid of, right? There's stuff that you need to be scared of. Be of good courage. You know, as leaders of anything, whether it's leaders in ministry, leaders in business, leaders over any kind of team, we have to be so conscious and so aware of the culture that we are creating around us. Is it a culture of negativity? Is it a culture to where we're concerned or we're, or we're allowing grumbling and complaining like we talked about last week, right? Is it an atmosphere of faith and faith only? Or is it an atmosphere of faith but also relying on myself? Is it an atmosphere of looking at the promises of God and saying the promises of God are true, they're going to happen, and I'm going to rely on the promises of God? Or is it looking at the promises of God and saying I rely on them, but I also rely on myself? This begs the question, did Moses plant the seed of negativity? Verse 21, it says this, So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin, as far as Rahab, near the entrance of Hamath. Verse 25, And they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. Verse 26. Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him and said, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey. So they go out, the 12 spies, they come back and say, hey, this is the land exactly the way God said it was going to be. This is the promised land. This is the land that flows with milk and honey. But how, do you, how many of you know that this story doesn't exactly end up good, does it? Verse 28, nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Malachites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome them. Verse 31, But the man who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. So we've been hanging out, and we've been talking about this, that these are the same men, same people who saw the parting of the Red Sea, the manna from heaven, the pillar of cloud, the fire at nighttime, God's protection, God's miracle working power, these are the same men. But somehow, all of a sudden, God's not able to give them this land. Somehow, all of a sudden, God's not able to bring them into the promised land, into the promises of God? You see, any time in life that you're on the brink of fulfilling your God calling, your God potential, or you're at the moment where God has brought you an opportunity right before you, one thing you will have to do is you will have to reject negativity. You'll have to reject negativity. We live in such a negative world. In fact, you could say that By nature, we are some of the most negative people. I know for myself, I am one of the most negative people. I can go around by nature and look at everything that's wrong in a situation. 
I can go around this place and pick out everything that I see, everything that's going wrong. Matter of fact, I can go to one of the greatest companies, one of the greatest places on earth, which is Disney. And in the middle of summertime, because it's so hot and the lines are long, I can go around picking out everything at Disney World that is the worst because I'm in a bad mood, right? We can let negativity affect our process, affect the way we're thinking. You know, something about that too is it doesn't take a genius, it doesn't take all that smarter person to look at a situation and to see the negative, does it? Anybody can look and to see what's wrong with the situation. Anyone can. It ruins our perspective when we're always looking at the negative. We're always looking at what is wrong. See, you will have to reject negativity. You'll have to reject it. Why? Because negativity is a tool Satan uses to try to rob you from all God has for you in your life. See, he brings just a little bit of doubt. He'll bring just a little bit of doubt. Someone telling you you're not good enough. Someone telling you you're not able. To rob you of your hope and to rob you of your faith. He brings negativity to get your mind off the size of your God and on the size of the challenge that's in front of you. And let me encourage you this morning. No great thing, no great thing is ever accomplished without a challenge. No great thing is ever accomplished without a reason for not to do it. You want to accomplish greatness in your life. It's not going to be just handed over to you. You're going to have to go out, and you're going to have to do what God tells you to do. But God does not bring you to an opportunity, to a place where you're on the border of reaching into the promised land, the border of going after your destiny to then abandon you, does he? You will have to decide to reject negativity and to go after the things of God. You'll say, well, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. Yes, you are, because Jesus says you are, because you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You'll say, I'm not smart enough. Don't worry about it. The Bible says God's wisdom cries out to his children from the highways and byways of life. You'll say, well, I've really messed up. Don't worry about it. God has already forgiven you, and he's forgotten about it, as far as the east is from the west. You'll say, I look at the challenge, and it's too hard. It's going to be too hard to do. Listen, God is with you. God is with you. And usually the harder it is, the greater the reward is. This, look at this, verse 32, it says this. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. Isn't that exactly what negativity does? Doesn't negativity rob you of your perspective? I mean, devours its inhabitants. Obviously, the people who were inhabiting the land, it wasn't devouring them, was it? See, negativity causes you to see the negative, and then you start to make grand generalizations and sweeping statements about your life, and sweeping statements about what you see that is wrong. And you blow things away out of proportion. Do you not? We say stuff like, all the men in my family, they're alcoholics. Listen, you don't have to be. You can break that cycle in your family. You don't have to make those kind of sweeping statements. Why don't you be the person that rejects negativity and changes the course of your family for eternity? Just reject the negativity in your life. Reject it. But how do you reject it? How do you reject like, negativity? Numbers 14.6. Let's look at this. Numbers 14.6. But Joshua and Caleb, who were among those who spied out the land, tore their clothes. Now, you can kind of see like WWE, ripping the shirt open, right? This is a, um, when I was reading the study notes, this is a call for distress. So they're in a distressed fashion right here, okay? 
And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is ex an exceedingly good land. Verse 8. If the Lord delights in us, then he'll bring us into the land and give it to us. A land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people in the land, for they are our bread. They are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. So, how do you reject negativity? You stand on faith. You stand on faith. You stand on faith to reject negativity in your life. You know what separates heroes from ordinary people, from average people? They have faith, determination, and perspective. Faith, determination, I'm sorry, focus. Faith, determination, and focus. The attitude, you're not going to rob me from what God has for me. You keep your negativity. I'm going forward in the things of God and the things that God has for my family. I'm going forward. I'm rejecting the negativity that you're bringing along with me. Listen, what the world is doing, you don't have to do. We are in the world, but not of it. Amen? Yes. You love people. You give grace to people. You don't sit with judgment and with condemnation. Judgment and condemnation is not getting Christianity anywhere, is it? Sitting back and judging and having negativity is not getting Christianity anywhere. You know what? You have to say, me and my family, we're going to get exactly what God has for us. We're going after it 100%. We're not going for anything less than exactly what God has for us. But that didn't happen for these people. That didn't happen for them. See, look, God doesn't let them into the promised land. Ten men's, ten, ten men's negativity affects two million people from walking into the promises of God. Ten men's negativity affects two million people from walking into the promises of God. They left Egypt, and they were right on the border of walking into the promised land. And because of ten men's negativity, it keeps them back. They have to go back into the wilderness for 40 years. You see, negativity, it spreads like wildfire. That's what it does. And you've got to reject negativity in your life. So God gets mad at the nation of Israel. Thank God that we are under the new covenant. Thank God that we're under the blood of Jesus. Because I would be concerned for us even. And the end result is a nation of Israel is going to have to go back into the wilderness for 40 years. For 40 years. Verse 23. They certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers. This is God talking. Nor any of those who rejected me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land where he went. And his descendants shall inherit it. Verse 30, he adds Joshua to it, except for Caleb the son of and Joshua, the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter the land. Look what just happened. God just told Moses that he's not even entering the land. Because Moses didn't end well. He led the people out of slavery, out of bondage. Because of this one decision, this poor decision to allow negativity to affect them. They're not listening to God because God was going to give them the land. Not even he is going to enter the promised land. Every person that rejected entered the promised land is getting sent back into the wilderness for an entire generation to die, except for Joshua and Caleb. Let's think a moment. Imagine being in Caleb and Joshua's shoes in this moment. Here's the promised land. They're right on the verge of entering into the promised land, right on the verge of going into where God has for them. And now they 
because of this decision, have to go back into the wilderness? Not only do they have to go back into the wilderness for 40 years, everyone they love, everyone they care about is going to die. They have to go back and serve Moses, who they know is not even going to lead them anywhere. Can we just talk real this morning? What do you do when other people's choices rob you from the promises of God? What do you do when other people's choices rob you from the promises of God? I'm not talking about your choices. You know, we make bad choices. We'll make bad decisions. And we kind of learn to deal with them. That was my bad choice. I'll take, the, I'll take the consequences on. I'm talking about other people's choices. What do you do when other people's choices rob you from the promises of God? What do you do when a 16-year-old daughter comes home and tells you she's pregnant? What do you do? What do you do when the greed on Wall Street collapses your retirement and you lose everything? What do you do? What do you do when tragedy strikes your family because of a drunk driver? What do you do? This isn't fake stuff. We get prayer requests like this all the time in, at church. What do you do? Do you quit? Do you give up? Do you run from God? Do you get mad? Do you get negative for the next 20 years of your life? What do you do? I'll tell you this, you don't give up. And you definitely don't give up on God. You definitely do not give up on God. Because God is with you. It says, God will never leave you nor forsake you. He is with you all along. And so often the world will tell you in those moments, it's because of your past, you deserve that. Not true. You're just not good enough to go into the promised land. They will say, why were you even going to go and do all that God stuff anyways? When life doesn't play along, and we have that feeling that we want to run from God, I want to encourage you this morning, don't run from God. When your life has been put into hell, don't run away from God. You run to God. And don't forget, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you will fear no evil because God is with you. Amen? And he will never leave you nor forsake you. Your life may be tough and you might be going through a difficult time, a difficult moment, but don't give up because God is with you. Don't give up. God's promises are still true for you. He is still with you. He's a God who restores, he heals, and he delivers. His hand is with you. He has a purpose for your life. He has a purpose for my life. He has a purpose for your life. Jeremiah 29 says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Not plans to harm you, but plans for you to prosper. Paraphrasing. That word plans there, when you're looking back, is actually the word purpose in the Greek. So I know the purpose I have for you. I know the purpose I have for you. Sometimes we get so scared, and I know I've had this before in my own life, that somehow because of me screwing something up, that I've missed my God purpose. That somehow I've missed the plan that God had for me. But he has a purpose for you. So sometimes plans can change. But God's, still pur God's purpose is still there for you. It never wavers. It's like GPS. When you take a long turn, what does it say? 
recalculating, right? You take another wrong turn, you do something wrong, or something else affects it, right? Recalculating, recalculating, recalculating. God has a purpose for your life. And though you might have missed a plan to get to the end, he has another plan that just begins. He is recalculating along the way. Recalculating, recalculating. God has a purpose for your life. What I want to see is I want us to walk in God's purpose in our life. If we as individuals here at Journey begin to grab hold of the God purpose in our life, man, why don't you see what God does here? Right? Wait to see what God does. Begin to dream again. I'm one of those people to where I just love dreaming. I love dreaming. I love thinking about what God is doing in my life and what God is going to do next. And I have these big, huge dreams, and I just pray that, you know, God, help me learn right now where I'm at so I can walk in whatever you have for me next. You know, along the way, God is always teaching us something. Whatever season of life you're in, God is always teaching you that so that you can go and you can walk in God's purpose eventually the purpose of God that he has for you. So my prayer always is, God, wherever I'm at right now, teach me the lesson you're trying to teach me so I can walk in your God purpose. Because that's what I want. I want that for myself, I want that for my family, and I want that for you this morning. That we would be people that walks in God's purpose for us. We haven't missed it yet. God can create a new plan to get you there, amen? Amen. My, uh, my wife and I, we, um, I've, I've bought um, and I've sold three different houses and moved into new places and stuff like that, and um, it's always been a pretty easy process <laughs> um, along the way. It wasn't that big of a deal. But this past experience that we had was uh, less than easy, <laughs> you could say. Everything that could go wrong, it felt like just went wrong. By the end of, we just recently moved closer to the church because we wanted to be, we just wanted to be closer. And um, we were on the other side of Jacksonville uh, near Mayport area, and it was 35, 40 minute drive, and I just couldn't do it anymore. And um, so we moved a little closer, and along the process, it was just, it was difficult. Everything in the house that could go wrong that we were selling was wrong and bad after the inspection. We had to get... um, contractors out to fix things, and money just kept on running up, running up, running up. It became something that was just very discouraging in my life. I was stressed out over it, it felt like all the time. And you just get discouraged, you know that feeling? Just being discouraged. It felt like even going into the house that we're buying, just problems with stuff that was outside of our control along the way. At the end of the process, my wife, she looks at me, and she says to me, with tears in her eyes, after the whole process was over with, that God, Adam, God's hand is still with us. God's hand is still with us. And along the way, we couldn't see God working in the situation. But man, he was working the entire time. He was working the entire time. And though it might be hard, the reward is good. Sometimes we encounter things that are hard. The harder it is, the better it is in the end. Amen? God has a purpose for your life. Though plans have changed, he still has a purpose. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes this morning. If you were here this morning and you want to walk in God's purpose for your life, and you've never accepted Jesus Christ into your heart. Would you do something this morning? Would you raise your hand? He has given his life on the cross as a free gift of salvation. And if you are here this morning and you want to accept that free gift of salvation and you want to walk in your God purpose, would you raise your hand this morning to give your life to Jesus? Is there anyone in here this morning? I see that hand. Anyone else? 
I'll give it just a moment longer. Amen. Jesus, we thank you this morning for that one hand that was raised, Father. We thank you, God, for the free gift of salvation, Jesus, that comes through your blood. God, we thank you for your purpose for our life, Jesus. May we walk fully in that, God. May we fully walk in your grace and your mercy, Jesus. God, we want nothing less than the plans and the purpose that you have for us, God. May we be able to reject negativity, God. May we be able to reject negativity and walk in the purpose that you have for us, God. May we not allow man's grumbling and complaining like we talked about last week to hold us back from what you have for us, Jesus. God, may people all over this room this morning begin to dream again. God dreams for their life. And may they walk in it, God. It is not too late. Your purpose is there, Jesus, still. Lord, we thank you that you never leave us nor forsake us. That we can stand on your word and we can stand with you, Jesus. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We give you this morning. Everyone said amen. 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 Hey, thanks so much for coming this morning. Yeah. Uh, grab an Easter card if you haven't already. Let's, let's just invite tons of people. We have the opportunity, the greatest opportunity this week to get people to church who normally would never come. Amen? So let's go and do that. Be on mission this week. Love you guys.